The Pharsalia by Lucan. Book 8, Part 2. They hoist their sails for Cyprus shaped, whose altars more than all the goddess loves who from the Paphian wave sprang, mindful of her birth, if such be truth, and gods have origin. Past the craggy isle, Pompeius sailing, left at length astern its southern cape and struck across the main with winds transverse and tides, nor reached the mount, grateful to sailors for its nightly gleam, but to the bounds of Egypt hardly one with battling canvas where divided Nile pours through the shallows his Pelusian stream. Now was the season when the heavenly scale most nearly balances the varying hours, once only equal, for the wintry day repays to night her losses of the spring. And Magnus, learning that the Egyptian king lay by Mount Cassius ere the sun was set, or flagged his canvas, thither steered his ship. Already had a horseman from the shore, in rapid gallop to the trembling court, brought news their guest was come. Short was the time for counsel given, but in haste were met all who advised the base Pelean king. Monsters, inhuman. There Achorius sat, less harsh in failing years, in Memphis born, of empty rites, and guardian of the rise of fertilizing Nile. While he was priest, not only once had Apis lived the space marked by the crescent on his sacred brow. First was his voice, for Magnus raised and troth, and, but, and for the king, pledges of the king deceased. But skilled in counsel meet for shameless minds and tyrant hearts, Pothinus dared to claim judgment of death on Magnus. Laws and right make many guilty, Ptolemaeus king. And faith thus lauded brings its punishment when it supports the fallen. To the fates yield thee, and to the gods the wretched shun. But seek the happy, as the stars from earth differ and fire from ocean, so from right expedience. The tyrant shorn of strength who ponders justice, and regard for right brings ruin on a throne. For lawless power, the best defense is crime, and cruel deeds find safety but in doing. He that aims at piety must flee the regal hall. Virtue's the bane of rule. He lives in dread who shrinks from cruelty. Nor let this chief unpunished scorn thy youth, who thinks that thou, not even the conquered from our shore canst bar, nor to a stranger, if thou wouldst not reign. Resign thy scepter, for the ties of blood speak for thy banished sister. Let her rule o'er Nile and Pharos. We shall at the least preserve our Egypt from the Latian arms. What Magnus owned not, ere the war was done, nor no more shall Caesar Driven from all the world, trusting no more to fortune, now he seeks some foreign na nation which may share his fate. Shades of the slaughtered in the civil war compel him. Nor from Caesar's arms alone, but from the Senate also does he fly, whose blood outpoured has gorged the salian fowl. Monarchs he fears, whose all he hath destroyed, and nations piled in one ensanguined heap, by him deserted. Victim of the blow, Thessalia dealt, refused in every land. He asked for help from ours, not yet betrayed. But none than Egypt with this chief from Rome has juster quarrel, who has sought with arms to stain our pharos, distant from our, the strife and peaceful ever, and to make our realm suspected by his victor. Why alone should this our country please thee in thy fall? Why bringst thou here the burden of thy fates, Pharsalia's curse? In Caesar's eyes, long since, we have a fence that, which by the sword alone can find its condonation, in that we, by thy persuasion from the Senate gain, this our dominion. By our prayers we helped, if not by arms, thy cause. This sword which fate bids us make ready, 
Not for thee I hold prepared, but for the vanquished. And on thee, would it had been on Caesar, falls the stroke. For we are born, as all things, to his side. And dost thou doubt, since thou art in my power, thou art my victim? By what trust in us camp'st thou, unhappy? Scarce our people tills the fields, though softened by the refluent Nile. Know well our strength, and know we can no more. Rome, neath the ruin of Pompeius, lies. Shalt thou, king, uphold him? Shalt thou dare to steer, stir Pharsalia's ashes, and to call war to thy kingdom? Ere the fight was fought, we joined not either army. Shall we now make Magnus friend, whom all the world deserts? and fling a challenge to the conquering chief and all his proud successes? Fair is help lent in disaster, yet reserved for those whom fortune favors. Faith her friend selects, not from the wretched. They decree the crime. Proud is the boyish tyrant that so soon his slaves permit him to so great a deed to give his favoring voice. And for the work, they choose Achilles. Where the treacherous shore runs out in sand below the Cassian Mount, and where the shallow waters of the sea attest the Syrtes near, in little boat, Achilles and his partners in the crime with swords embark. Ye gods, and shall the Nile and barbarous Memphis and the effeminate crew the throngs Pelusian Canopus raise its thoughts to such an enterprise? Do thus our fates press on the world? Is Rome thus fallen, that in our civil phrase the Faxian sword finds place, or Egypt? Oh, may civil war be thus far faithful, that the hand which strikes be of our kindred, and the foreign fiend held worlds apart. Pompeius, great in soul, noble in spirit, had deserved a death from Caesar's self. And king, hast thou no fear at such a ruin of so great a name? And dost thou dare, when heaven's high thunder rolls, thou, puny boy, to mingle with its tones thine impure utterance? Had he not won a world by arms, and thrice in triumph scaled the sacred capital? and vanquished kings, and championed the Roman Senate's cause, he, kinsman of the victor? T'was enough to cause forbearance in a Farian king, that he was Roman. Wherefore with his sword dost stab our breasts? Thou know'st not, impious boy, how stand thy fortunes. Now no more by right hast thou the scepter of the land of Nile. For prostrate, Vanquished in the civil wars is he who gave it. Furling now his sails, Magnus with care approached the cursed land, when in their little boat the murderous crew drew nigh, and feigning from the Egyptian court a ready welcome, blamed the double tides broken by shallows in their scanty beach unfit for fleets, and bade him to their craft, leaving his loftier ship. Had not the fates, eternal and unalterable laws, called for their victim and decreed his end, now near at hand, his comrade's warning voice yet might have stayed his course. For if the court, to Magnus, who bestowed the Farian crown, in truth were open, should not king and fleet in pomp have come to greet him? But he yields. The fates compel. Welcome to him was death rather than fear. But rushing to the side, his spouse would follow, for she dared not stay, fearing the guile. Then he, Abide, my wife and son, I pray you, from the shore afar, await my fortunes. Mine shall be the life to test their honor. But Cornelia still withstood his bidding, and with arms outspread, frenzied, she cried, And whither without me, cruel, departest? Thou forbats me share of thy risk the salian. Dost again command that I should part from thee? No happy star breaks on our sorrow. If from every land thou dost debar me, why didst turn aside in flight to Lesbos? 
On the waves alone am I thy fit companion? Thus, in vain, leaning upon the bulwark, dazed with dread. Nor could she turn her straining gaze aside, nor see her parting husband. All the fleet stood silent, anxious, waiting for the end. Not that they feared the murder which befell, but lest their leader might with humble prayer kneel to the king he made. As Magnus passed, a Roman soldier from the Farian boat, Septimius, salutes him. Gods of heaven! There stood he, minion to a barbarous king, nor bearing still the javelin of Rome, but vile in all his arms, giant in form, fierce, brutal, thirsting as a beast may thirst for carnage. Didst thou fortune for the sake of nations spared a dread Pharsalus field this savage monster's blows? Or dost thou place throughout the world for thy mysterious ends some ministering swords for civil war? Thus, to the shame of victors and of gods, this story shall be told in days to come. A Roman swordsman, once within thy ranks, slave to the orders of a puny prince, severed Pompeius' neck. And what shall be Septimius's fame hereafter? By what name this deed be called, if Brutus wrought a crime? Now came the end, the latest hour of all. Wrapped to the boat was Magnus, of himself no longer master, and the miscreant crew unsheathed their swords, which when the chieftain saw, he swathed his visage, for he scorned unveiled to yield his life to fortune, closed his eyes, and held his breath within him, lest some word or sob escaped, might mar the deathless fame his deeds had won. And when within his side Achilles plunged his blade, nor, nor sound, nor cry he gave, but calm consented to the blow, and proved himself in dying, in his breast these thoughts revolving. In the years to come, men shall make mention of our Roman toils, gaze on this boat, ponder the Farian faith, and think upon thy fame and all the years while fortune smiled. But for the ills of life, how thou couldst bear them, this man shall not know, save by thy death. Then weigh thou not the shame that waits on thine undoing, who strikes that blow is Caesar's. Men may tear this frame and cast it mangled to the winds of heaven. Yet have I prospered, nor can all the gods call back my triumphs. Life may bring defeat, but death no misery. If my spouse and men and son behold me murdered, silently the more I suffer. Admiration at my death shall prove their love. Thus did Pompeius die, guarding his thoughts. But now Cornelia filled the air with lamentations at the sight. O oh, husband, whom my wicked self hath slain, that lonely isle apart thy bane hath been, and stayed thy coming. Caesar to the Nile had one before us, for what other hand may do such work? But whosoe'er thou art, sent from the gods with power for Caesar's ire, or thine own sake, to slay, thou dost not know where lies the heart of Magnus. Haste and do. Such were his prayer. No other punishment befits the conquered. Yet, him let, yet let him, ere his end, see mine, Cornelius, on me the blame of all these wars, whose soul of Roman wives followed my spouse afield, nor feared the fates. And in disaster, when the kings refused, received and cherished him. Did I deserve thus to be left of thee, and didst thou seek to spare me? And when rushing on thine end, was I to live? Without the monarch's help, death shall be mine, either by headlong leap beneath the waters, or some sailor's hand shall bind around this neck the fatal cord. Or else some comrade worthy of his chief drive to my heart his blade for Magnus' sake, and claim the service done to Caesar's arms. What? Does your cruelty withhold my fate? 
Ah, still he lives, nor is it mine as yet to win this freedom. They forbid me death, kept for the victor's triumph. Thus she spake, while friendly hands upheld her fainting form, and sped the trembling vessel from the shore. Men say that Magnus, when the deadly blows, fell thick upon him, lost, nor formed as divine, nor la venerated mean. And as they gazed, upon his lacerated head they marked, still on his features, anger with the gods. Nor death could change his visage, for in act of striking fierce Septimius' murderous hand, thus making worse his crime, severed the folds that swathed the face, and seized the noble head and drooping neck, ere yet was fled the life. Then placed upon the bench, and with his blade, slow at its hideous task, and blows unskilled, hacked through the flesh, and break the knotted bone. For yet man had not learned by swoop of sword deftly to lop the neck. Achilles claimed, the gory head dissevered. What, shalt thou, a Roman soldier, while thy blade still yet reeks from Magnus' slaughter, play the second part to this base varlet of the Pharian king, nor bear thyself the bleeding trophy home? Then, that the impious boy, ah, shameful fate, might know the features of the hero slain, Seized by the locks, the dread of kings which waved upon his stately front, on Farian pike the head was lifted. With, while almost the life gave to the tongue its accents, and the eyes were yet scarce glazed, that head at whose command was peace or war, that tongue whose eloquent tones would move assemblies, and that noble brow on which were showered the rewards of Rome. Nor to the tyrant did the sight suffice to prove the murder done, the perishing flesh, the tissues, and the brain he bids remove by art nefarious. The shriveled skin draws tight upon the bone, and poisonous juice gives to the face its lineaments in death. Last of thy race, thou base degenerate boy, all about to perish soon, and yield the throne to thine incestuous sister, while the prince from Macedon here in consecrated vault now rests, and ashes of the king are closed in mighty pyramids, and lofty tombs of thine unworthy fathers mark the graves. Shall Magnus' body, hither and thither born, be battered, headless, by the ocean wave? Too much it troubled thee to guard the cur course unmutilated for his kinsman's eye to witness. Such the faith which fortune kept with prosperous Pompeius to the end. T'was not for him in evil days some ray of light to hope for, shattered from the height of power in one short moment to his death. Tears of unbroken victories balanced down by one day's carnage, in his happy time, heaven did not harass him, nor did she spare in misery. Long fortune held the hand that dashed him down. Now beaten by the sands, torn upon rocks, the sport of ocean's waves poured through its wounds, his headless carcass lies, saved by the lacerated trunk, unknown. Yet ere the victor touched the Farian sands, some scanty rites to Magnus fortune gave, lest he should want all burial. Pale with fear came Cordus, hasting from his hiding place. Quaestor, he joined Pompeius on thy shore, a daily in Cyprus, bringing in his train a cloud of evils. Through the darkening shades, love for the dead compelled his trembling steps hard by the marin of the deep to search, and drag to land his master. Through the clouds the moon shone sadly, and her rays were dim, but by its hue upon the hoary main he knew the body. In a fast embrace he holds it, wrestling with the greedy sea, and deftly watching for a refluent wave gains help to bring his burden to the land. 
Then clinging to the loved remains, the wounds, washed by his tears, thus to the gods he speaks, and misty stars obscure. Here, fortune, lies Pompeius, thine. No costly incense rare or pomp of funeral he dares to ask, nor that the smoke rise heavenward from his pyre with eastern odors rich, nor that the necks of pious Romans bear him to the tomb, their parent, while the forum shall resound with dirges, nor that triumphs one of yore be borne before him, nor for sorrowing hosts to cast their weapons forth. Some little shell he begs as for the meanest, laid in which his mutilated course may reach the flame. Grudge not his misery, the pile of wood lit by this menial hand. Is it not enough that his Cornelia with disheveled hair weeps not beside him at his obsequies, nor with a last embrace shall place the torch beneath her husband dead, but on the deep hard by still wanders? Burning from afar, he sees the pyre of some ignoble youth, deserted of his own, with none to guard, and quif quickly drawing from beneath the limbs some glowing logs. Whoe'er thou art, he said, neglected shade, uncared for, dear to none, yet happier than Pompeius in thy death, pardon I ask that this my stranger hand should violate thy tomb. Yet if to shades be sense or memory, Gladly shalt thou yield this from thy pyre to Magnus. T'were thy shame, blessed with dual burial, if his remains were homeless. Speaking thus, the wood of flame, back to the headless trunk at speed, he bore, which hanging on the margin of the deep, almost the sea had won. In sandy trench, the gathered fragments of a broken boat, trembling, he placed around the noble limbs. No pile above the corpse, nor under lay, nor was the fire beneath. Then as he crouched beside the blaze, O oh, greatest chief, he cried, majestic champion of Hesperia's name, if to be tossed unburied on the deep, rather than these poor rites thy shade prefer, from these mine offices thy mighty soul withdraw, Pompeius. Injuries dealt by fate command this duty, lest some bird or beast or ocean monster or fierce Caesar's wrath should venture aught upon thee. Take the fire, all that thou canst, by Roman hand at least enkindled, and should fortune grant return to loved Hesperia's land, not here shall rest thy sacred ashes, but within an urn Cornelia, from this humble hand received, shall place them. Here upon a meagre stone we draw the characters to mark thy tomb. These letters reading may some kindly friend bring back thine head dissevered, and may grant full funeral honors to thine earthly frame. Then did he cherish the enfeebled fire till Magnus' bodies mingled, body mingled with its flames. But now the harbinger of coming dawn had paled the constellation. He in fear seeks for its hiding place. Whom dost thou dread, madman? What punishment for such a crime, for which thy fame by rumor trumpet-tongued has been sent down to ages? Praise is thine for this thy work at impious Caesar's hands. Sure of a pardon, go, confess thy task, and beg the head dissevered. But his work was still unfinished, and with pious hand, Fearing some foe, he seizes on the bones, now half consumed, and sinews, and the wave pours in upon them, and in shallow trench commits them to the earth, and lest some breeze might bear away the ashes, or by chance some sailor's anchor might disturb the tomb, a stone he places, and with stick half burned, traces the sacred name. Here Magnus lies. And art thou, fortune, pleased that such a spot should be his tomb, which even Caesar's self had chosen, rather than permit his course to rest unburied? Why with thoughtless hand confine his shade within the narrow bounds of this poor sepulchre, where the furthest sand hangs on the margin of the baffled deep, cabined he lies, 
yet where the Roman name is known, and empire, such in truth shall be the boundless measure of his resting place. Blot out this stone, this proof against the gods. Oetta finds room for Hercules alone, and Nysa's mountain for the Bromian god. Not all the lands of Egypt should suffice for Magnus dead, and shall one Pharian stone mark his remains? Yet should no turf disclose his title, peoples of the earth would fear to spurn his ashes, and the sands of Nile no foot would tread. But if the stone deserves so great a name, then add his mighty deeds. Write Lepidus conquered, and the Alpine war, and fierce Sertorius by his aiding arm, o'erthrown, the chariots which as night he drove, Cilician pirates driven from the main, and commerce safe to nations, eastern kings defeated, and the barbarous northern tribes. Write that from arms he ever sought the robe, write that content upon the capital, thrice only triumphed he, nor asked his due. What mausoleum were for such a chief a fitting monument? This paltry stone records no syllable of the lengthy tale of honors, and the name which men have read upon the sacred temples of the gods, and lofty arches built of hostile spoils. On desolate sands here marks his lowly grave, with characters uncouth, such as the glance of passing traveller or Roman guest might pass unnoticed. Thou Egyptian land, by destiny foredoomed to bear a part in civil warfare, not unreasoning sang high Cumae's prophetess, when she forbade the stream Pelusian to the Roman arms, and all the banks which in the summer tide are covered by his flood. What grievous fate shall I call down upon thee? May the Nile turn back his water to his source, thy fields want for the winter rain, and all the land crumble to desert wastes. We in our fanes have known thine Isis and thy hideous gods, half hounds, half human, and the drum that bids to sorrow, and Osiris, whom thy dirge proclaims for man. Thou, Egypt, in thy sand, our dead containest. Nor, though her temples now serve a proud master, yet has Rome required Pompeius ashes. In a foreign land still lies her chief. But though men feared at first the victor's vengeance, now at length receive thy magnus bones, if still the restless wave hath not prevailed upon that hated shore. Shall men have fear of tombs, and dread to move the dust of those who should be with the gods? Oh, may my country place the crime on me, if crime it be, to violate such a tomb of such a hero, and to bear his dust home to Ausonia. Happy, happy he who bears such holy office in his trust. Haply, when famine rages in the land, or burning southern winds, or fire abounds, and earthquake shocks, and Rome shall pray an end from angry heaven, by the God's command, in counsel given, shalt thou be transferred to thine own city, and the priests shall bear thy sacred ashes to their last abode. Who now may seek beneath the raging crab, or hot Cyene's waste, or Thebes a thirst, but under the raining, rainy Pleiades, t or to gaze, on Nile's broad stream, or whose may exchange, on the Red Sea, or in Arabian ports, some eastern merchandise, shall turn in awe to view the venerable stone that marks thy grave, Pompeius, and shall worship more thy dust commingled with the arid sand, thy shade, though exiled, than the fane upreared on Cassius' mount to Jove. In temples shrined, and gold, thy memory were viler deemed. Fortune lies with thee in thy lowly tomb, and makes thee rival of Olympus' king. More awful is that stone by Libyan seas, lashed, than our conqueror's altars. There in earth, a deity rests to whom all men shall bow, more than to God's Tarpeian and his name, shall shine the brighter in the days to come, for that no marble tomb about him stands, nor lofty monument. That little dust time shall soon scatter, 
and the tomb shall fall, and all the proofs shall perish of his death. And happier days shall come when men shall gaze upon the stone, nor yet believe the tale. And Egypt's fable, that she holds the grave of great Pompeius, be believed no more than Crete's, which boasts the sepulchre of Jove. End of Book Eight And...